Today's message comes from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as though as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I want to start us off uh, before as, as we delve into our passage with um, two stories and one, um, I guess, hypothetical situation. Uh, but uh, the first story, it's, it, it gets... Uh, it starts light and gets a little more serious, but um, I um, was a college pastor in Philadelphia for a good number of years, and while I was there, um, I was mainly taking care of uh, the UPenn campus, and in our church, we had different colleges uh, and students come, so each uh, pastoral intern uh, would take care of each campus, but on one of our retreats, uh, I, uh, it was uh, by chance, I got to sit with some of the Drexel students who I didn't know very well, uh, for one of the meal times, and they, uh, in their naughty questioning, asked me, "Who is your favorite Penn student um, in the ministry?" And uh, I, for their benefit and heart, I did not answer them the whole meal. Um, I did have one, but I did not tell them. <laughs> um, uh, so if you know, having that uh, favorite, you can kind of already sense that it's probably not the best thing to do, if especially if. Uh, we have a lot of teachers in here. Um, and uh, the second story I'd want to share is uh, more of a, a personal story. Um, I have two older sisters, and uh, growing up, this is around college time, I would come back from the States uh, to visit my parents uh, who lived here. Uh, and uh, we ate together one day, uh, and uh, very naturally, my sisters uh, went to the kitchen to clean up and do the dishes. And I, in my very um, irresponsible but cunning manner, uh, followed my father to the couch uh, where he was watching some dramas, and I sat next to him very silently, hoping that no one would notice. My sisters noticed. So after a little while, they started yelling at me, like, why aren't you helping us clean up? Um, and they were like, you know, don't you, just because you're uh, the you know, last son, you don't get any favoritism in this household, and so on and so forth. Um, and for some of you, you guys are probably sensing uh, more of that unfairness in that story. Um, but the third uh, hypothetical situation I want to share with you, let's say during Sunday services, um, and this is certainly not the case, uh, but we assign seats in the worship service. Let's say we do that. It's an odd thought, right? Uh, but let's say the condition for assigning seats is, let's say the first three rows uh, can only be taken by people who make more than six figures. And I'm thinking dollars, because I don't know how to do one yet. Um, so if you're making 100000 or more, you get to seat in, uh, sit in these uh, front row seats. So, and if you make less than that, the rule would be that you have to sit, you know, third row and back. And maybe we would even variegate it by number more and more. Just imagine if church was like that. That would be very ridiculous, right? Um, 
And it would be uh, an outrageous proposition uh, if someone were to make that. And that is kind of what James in our passage is trying to address in some ways. Uh, partiality, favoritism on conditions that are not gospel-based. And he's trying to address uh, the readers and the listeners here and us today uh, about that message. James exhorts, uh, as he begins in the passage, show no partiality. Don't show favoritism. Most of us uh, have this sense that it is wrong to discriminate. I think we have a good sense of that, that it's wrong to have favorites, uh, and that it's uh, not necessarily a very good thing to have partiality. Uh, and you can kind of remember the stories I just shared with you. Um, but we have to remember that being impartial uh, in these verses is not the same thing uh, as equality in the sense that we may normally think of. Uh, oftentimes we have conversations outside of church about equality, what things need to be in terms of being equal, uh, and they don't necessarily align with what James is trying to address. Uh, I'm not saying they don't overlap completely, but they don't align 100%. Uh, equality often is thought nowadays uh, to the extent that all differences is bad. In our conversations um, outside of church, often equality is, you know, don't, uh, you know, make sure all the differences get chucked out uh, of uh, just consideration uh, because they're all uh, bad, and we have to eliminate all the differences because they're good, or at the least, we can't talk about them. See, being impartial, at least according to James, what he's trying to focus on, uh, or not showing favoritism, is not about losing all distinctions. And there are good distinctions that God has given us. And partly is, I think Gospel City is very uh, representative, is that there are a lot of cultures uh, and in here, I don't even know how many cultures or backgrounds there are, but we certainly should not try to get rid of them after listening to this message. They are good things. And in those differences, in those distinctions, we want to be impartial. And James is ex exhorting us to do so. He's not saying everyone choose one culture and that's one we'll run, what we'll, we'll run with. He's saying with all these things, do not be impartial, do not show favoritism. Another topic that I probably just will mention because it's a huge one is gender. Gender is a distinction and difference that is God-given and good. There are obviously different nuances we can talk about, but equality, at least biblically speaking, doesn't mean we get rid of all those differences. Certainly there is more to be done in terms of equality between the genders in our way of living, but it doesn't mean that we are the same as male and female in, in terms of distinction. And another category perhaps we can mention is age. And I think it's apt to mention that in uh, our Korean context where age is a very large part of our society uh, and there are ways that we treat uh, different age groups differently in the way we relate to each other. Uh, and even in that context, James is telling us, it's not that you have to get rid of them, that you have to start, you know, you know the, not using your honorific if you're Korean to your parents and start talking down to them, if that is your custom. He's not saying that. He's saying in that distinction, in the way you do still honor your elder and for the elder to take care of the younger, still be impartial, still don't have favorites. So it's that uh, difficulty that James is kind of giving us uh, in that sense. So then we have to learn what does it mean to not show favoritism, to not show uh, partiality. Generally, it means to embrace all peoples, even with the differences. That's kind of the uh, general picture we can draw. James is also making a specific exhortation uh, to the community of believers here meaning that this message actually is directed primarily to the Christian community. It can be applied to outside, but he starts with my brothers, and this is gender inclusive in the language here. He says, my brothers, and he starts off with that. My brothers show no partiality, and he's talking to us, the Church of Christ, 
primarily and saying, show no partiality. And in trying to understand what he means by show no partiality, it's helpful to at least think about that phrase when he uses show no partiality. And I won't get into the language part, but it's actually tricky to translate um, that word, or it is a word, but in English it's three words. Um, And in the King James translation, if you go to the King James, I know many people don't use that anymore, Um, but it, it says, the wording is a little more positive, actually. Uh, Verse 1, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, uh, with respect of persons. It's a little weird, right? It it translates, show no partiality into respect of persons. It says, have respect of persons. If you actually go through uh, different translations, you can kind of make out maybe a, a wooden translation that says, not receiving faces, saying, my brethren, do not not receive faces if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very outward-focused comment. If you have someone, you see their face, accept them, receive them. James is kind of giving us uh, that exhortation. When the Bible tells us, show no partiality, it's telling us, don't discriminate, in particular, Uh, It's saying, based on outward appearances, especially outward uh, things of material possession. Particularly, don't do that. Show no partiality because of your outward appearance, what you have, what you own. Receive the faces without partiality. And he gives us, uh, and he's, he's saying based on money, status, position, ability, and many other outward things, he's saying don't show partiality based on those things. And he gives us the example of two people in the beginning. One wearing a gold ring. Anyone wearing a gold ring here? It's not a good example here, but <laughs> hide. Uh, just kidding. Um, but he's saying if, if someone comes in with a gold ring, and some other guy comes in with some shabby clothing, don't put the gold ring guy in front in the best seat and put the shabby clothing guy in the room back there where you can't even see the stage. He's saying, don't do that. Based on those outwardly things, don't discriminate, show partiality like that. And he's saying kind of, if I were to translate a little bit, and perhaps I've used this before, is if a homeless person would come into this congregation, And if they're not super disruptive behaviorally or anything like that, but they are, let's assume, not clean, and they smell because they haven't been able to shower for perhaps like a week or so. How many of us in this group, in this church, would consider asking them to dinner after service? How many of us would go to them and say, hey, sit here, sit here? and would greet them and do everything that we are doing today in service. Perhaps the situation of the homeless person is not that approachable since we don't uh, experience it that commonly, but perhaps I can make it a little more common. Think about your friends, or think about how you make your friends. Do you approach people or select your friends based on who you like or who you're comfortable with? I hope the answer is yes, because you do want to do that to an extent. It's not in and of itself bad. But is that all you do in making your friends, in approaching people? If someone is uncomfortable or if someone you don't like comes into your life, do you say, no, you're no, not you, goodbye? Do you only do that? Do you ever associate with people you normally wouldn't? I think Gospel City actually is a wonderful context to actually practice this passage because we are surrounded by people who are so different from us. The assembly of God, the church, the people of God is not a place where we are to discriminate, to show partiality. 
James is trying to be clear about that. This is not a place where you are partial based on those things. And if you are finding yourself in your life surrounded, only surrounded by people you are comfortable with, then perhaps you can ask yourself, am I missing something about the gospel? Am I not understanding something about the gospel that presses me outward towards discomfort? James gets in to the meat of things, and he tells us the anti-gospel nature of partiality and favoritism and how serious this is. And he places this in chapter 2 and in front of chapter 2 to accentuate that locationally. And he gives us four things at least that we can observe to understand that this is not just a negligible thing that it's not a small thing for the community of believers. First thing that we can learn is that it is a fruitless thing. It is fruitless. James says that if you are partial or show favoritism, you have, quote, become judges with evil thoughts. And I'm very thankful that Grace read Deuteronomy 10, 17. If you go back there, there is that uh, il illustration of bribery. And our passage is also kind of alluding to that. It's saying, if you show partiality, if you show favoritism, you're like a judge that takes a bribe. That's the picture that he's trying to draw uh, for us. And what does a bribe do to a judge? You know, no one's going to answer, but please think. A judge's main task is to make decisions and verdicts without the influence of outside things, of inconsequential, things that are irrelevant. His task is to make verdicts and decisions without those influences. A bribe destroys his or her ability to do just that. The judge becomes useless, fruitless, pointless. There's no reason why we should listen to such a judge. And James is trying to say, impartiality is like that. It's fruitless, it's pointless, it's useless. And secondly, he's telling us that impartiality, or partiality, is the opposite of love. James goes on, and he's trying to make it clear and more emphatic. If you show favoritism, it is sin. If you show favoritism in the way he's trying to illustrate towards us, it is the opposite of love. It is opposite of the second great commandment. He alludes to Mark 12 and Leviticus 19 and verses 8 and 9, and he tells us, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and convicted by the law as transgressors. He's be being very clear, saying, if you show partiality, it's not a small thing. You're actually being unloving. You're sinning before God, and it's that serious. The third thing that we learn is that partiality and favoritism is opposing Christ. It's the opposite of Christ. It is anti-gospel in that sense because it goes against the character of Christ, it says, show no partiality in the beginning verse as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Show no partiality as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, you shouldn't show partiality. And it's just a math, math equation. You can't do both. It doesn't work like that. They oppose each other. If you are showing favoritism, then you are opposing Christ. And James is being emphatic about that. He's saying it's that serious. You are going against the character of who Jesus Christ is. 
Deuteronomy 10, 16 to 20, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Luke 20, 21, when he asks about taxes, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality but truly teach the way of God. Acts 10, 34, 35, Peter speaks before the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. These verses connect the character of God, the character of Christ, and saying there is no partiality associated with that. There is no favoritism that has a place in someone who says, I want to look like God. And friends, the church is the body of Christ, and Christ is our head. And if that is true, we are to look like our head. And James is saying, our head has no partiality. And for us in the gospel and in Jesus Christ, we also should have no partiality. And the fourth thing that we can learn from James about partiality is that it is snobbery and pride. Favoritism and partiality is anti-gospel because it reveals the heart problem of snobbery, of pride. The gospel tells us initially the gospel eventually tells us that we are loved, but in the first instance, it tells us that you are no better than the person next to you. Turn next to the person, or turn to the person next to you and say, I am better than you. <laughs> I am very much better than you. I hope this is not like recorded in segments. I hope that was uncomfortable. <laughs> the more and more we are to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, we turn to our neighbor and say, I am no better than you. I am just as much a sinner as you. I am no better. Romans 3 tells us no one is righteous, no, not one. No one is righteous, no, not one. But when you show favoritism, when you show partiality, you are saying with your actions, I am better than you. I am better than you. That's why it's anti-gospel. Romans 3 says no one is righteous. And when you are partial, when you have favorites, you then turn that around and say, I don't know, I think I am actually better. The Bible and the gospel says there's actually only one discrimination, if I can even put it that way, that is allowed in our lives. And that is the discrimination between us and God. God is God and we are not. But we are not to say, I am different and better than another human being. The Bible does not allow from person to person, from human to human, to have partiality. And in our sin, we actually flip that. We say, God, I can deal with him. I can do whatever I want. I am better than God. That is sin. And that is sin. And we flip that around in our partiality and in our sin. And in the gospel, through Jesus Christ, God bridges the gap of sin between God and us. And the question James is trying to ask us in his gentle but emphatic way, how dare we keep discriminations and favoritism and preferences and partiality? Whether it's consciously or unconsciously, how do we say no, knowing what the gospel did for us? How do we say no to not inviting 
that person that may feel uncomfortable to us into our lives? How dare we pick and choose who we want to associate with? James is saying, my brethren, show no partiality if you hold in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of that verse, that very first verse, James even invokes the issue of glory, implying that a community that professes Christ but discriminates outwardly. He's alluding, saying the glory will not be seen in that community. The glory of God will not be seen by those people who are feeling that partiality. So, the applicational question is, how are we doing GCC? It's a simple question but I want us to ponder that. To the issue of partiality, to the issue of welcoming people into our lives, how are we doing? Hebrews 13, one to two instructs us, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have enter entertained angels unawares. Are we busy with our lives? And I know a lot of us are very, very busy. Just tending to our comfort, our needs, our preferences, our goals. So that when God places strangers near us, that we have no natural room to welcome them in. And that's even an unconscious way, a structural way, we become partial. We're so focused on ourselves that we have no room to pay attention to those around us. So James draws a very difficult picture, right? How can we get rid of all that partiality, all that favoritism? Well, little by little, in the gospel. But all of us do, I hope, acknowledge that we do struggle with uh, hints, maybe some of us more, uh, but some of us at least with hints of favoritism and partiality to some degree, if you remember that example in terms of picking friends. So how do we overcome that in the gospel? James here as emphatic as he sounds, is not trying to threaten us. And it sounds like that, the way I uh, put it. He's trying to exhort us, actually, once again, to see the mercy of Christ. He's trying to press us towards seeing the mercy of Christ and how he was impartial towards us. In this passage, he's going towards that and he's actually ending on that. He's asking us, do you really understand the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you really understand? And in that gospel, do you understand the mercy that you have been shown? Do you remember how you actually, perhaps spiritually speaking, keep wearing shabby clothes and not the gold ring? Do you remember how filthy and revolting you were, all of us, in our sin? And that that is the condition to which the gospel brings us out of. Do we understand that the Father, uh, our Father in heaven doesn't rank us in the way that perhaps the world wants us to? But how does he see us? all of us here who are in Christ. He sees us as children. Simply as children. His children. When we see the mercy of Christ, we can truly be merciful to others and really be welcoming to others, not out of pity, not because they're equal to you or similar to you or comfortable to you, but because you see how invaluable they are, 
how infinitely valuable they are to God. That the Son of God, Jesus Christ, shed his blood for that person. And because he did that, they are also his child. It is when you see that mercy, you can welcome them, even as strangers. When the community of Christ grasps this mercy, mercy, partiality will die. It has to die. And that's what James is telling us. Favoritism will die the more and more we grasp the mercy of Christ for us in our community. And I am reminded of the story in Luke 18, verses 9 to 14, about the Pharisee and tax collector. I won't get into it deeply, where they both go up to pray. The, the Pharisee is very proud about his prayer and uh, what he's doing, but the tax collector, very far off, beats his chest and prays, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If we steep our hearts in that gospel and how Christ saves us from that in his mercy and grace, partiality cannot take root. I want to end uh, our time uh, in this passage with a, a story to uh, perhaps help us uh, really come to grips uh, with uh, the message here. Um, when I was uh, doing my uh, master's in seminary, I was involved with uh, inner city ministry, where we uh, helped out with, um, we were not in the very nicest of neighborhoods. Um, if you know West Philly, that's, that was the neighborhood. And we had a lot of local kids come, uh, and we ran VBS for them, and we ran a summer day camp for them uh, throughout the summer from our church. Uh, and because we borrowed uh, a Korean church facility, we had to run a VBS for their kids. Uh, we gladly did it, so <laughs> it's not a complaint or anything like that. But uh, So we ran all those things. And during the week, we were running the VBS for the Korean church uh, kids. Um, so I was kind of uh, in charge, which meant I didn't really do anything. I just made sure nothing was, you know, going wrong. Uh, and then I had a lot of teachers really engaging with the students. Um, and I had a teacher by the name of Esther, uh, who one of the years uh, she helped out. And she was actually a germaphobe, uh, just, you know, just her habit-wise. So she hated germs and, and all those things. Uh, and uh, we were doing that VBS week, um, and I was roaming around one day, uh, just making sure that no one, nothing was out of place, no one was getting into trouble, uh, and Esther came running up to me and said, I need your help, I need your help, I need you right now. And I was like, oh no. Um, so then I followed her to uh, where she uh, went running, and it was in front of the guy's bathroom. And we can hear uh, this voice, little voice inside the bathroom saying, help. Help. And it wasn't very alarming. It was just very consistent. Help. Help. And I was puzzled. I think Esther knew what was going on more than me, um, but I was very puzzled. And I think she brought me because it was the guy's bathroom, so we went in together. Uh, and as we entered, we saw uh, one of the, the, our students, one of the kids, um, uh, and he was naked half uh, his waist down uh, as we entered. And we were like, well, I was like, what is going on? Um, and then we, we looked closer, and he was covered in his own feces. And we looked a little closer around the bathroom, and it was on the toilet. The feces was around the toilet. It was on the wall. It was on the sink. It was everywhere. Um, and later, later, uh, I realized when I talked to Esther and some of the other teachers that what had happened was uh, this was a, a special needs student. Um, and because we, as a church camp, we weren't very savvy about all those things, so that loss went, fought, fell through the cracks. And the teacher who was in charge of the student uh, wasn't fully aware. And when he asked, can I go to the bathroom, um, she said, or she or he said, sure. And he went, and he thought that he could do everything, but he kind of made mistakes and eventually got it on his clothes, and that's why he took his pants off in order to solve the problem. And then he was trying to wash things, but then he was getting it all over the place. 
as he was trying to solve the problem, he made more of a mess. And I was, as we entered the situation and I was trying to compute what was going on, Esther very quickly started cleaning the child up, wiping him down, getting paper towels, cleaning the sink. I don't know why I didn't help that much. Don't judge me. But <laughs> I should have done more. But in hind- afterwards, I-, I asked her, like, how are you so eager to help and clean him up in that situation? You're a germaphobe. And the thing that she said, I'm sure she said other things that really stuck with me, is that I just remembered that he was probably someone's child. And that just led her to help him out without partiality, without discrimination, just to help him out. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that we are also children. We are children of the king, just like that child that make a mess, that sin all the time. And yet, he is merciful to us, day in and day out. Christ came into our lives where there was a filthy stench of sin. And he didn't flinch. He didn't flinch. Instead, he embraced us with open arms and went to the cross to die for our sins. And I want to end with our verse that we started off with, to exhort us. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Gospel City, as individual Christians and as a church, Let's welcome each other without partiality, without favoritism, understanding that we have received immense mercy from our Lord. Let's pray at this time.